the heart of worship is uh, all about Jesus. And uh, as we come to the scriptures, we've become in worship. And uh, we come to this book, which, which is all about Jesus, from, from Genesis through Revelation, all about him. It's all about Jesus. Um, and, uh, uh, we, you know, sometimes people say, you know, you guys, you guys just worship the book. Well, no, we worship the God who's given us this book, who's t- who tells us and reveals to us Jesus in this, uh, in this word. Um, and uh, we're going through Proverbs, and uh, Proverbs is all about Jesus. Uh, the, Proverbs is, is the wisdom that Jesus lived out so that he could transform us when we put our faith in him, and so that we could live that wisdom that uh, he first lived uh, in, uh, in his life. So we're going um, gonna to pray together first and look at the uh, our text today, today, which is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 through chapter 19, verse 9. It's found on page 1012, if you're using the Bibles provided here in the church. Page 1012, uh, Proverbs 18, verse 22 through 19, verse 9. Um, we're going to pray first. Uh, I'm going to ask you... Pray for me that I will speak God's word clearly and truthfully. And I'm going to pray for you that you will hear God's word with power and with conviction and by the spirit of God. All right, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to worship you. It is really all about you. Everything in our life is meant to be a worship song to you. And it's all about you. And we want, we want that. We want to come back to that uh, as we come to your word today, as we open it and we, and we see what you've said. We ask that uh, you would, by your, by your spirit, empower us to hear. And uh, uh, hear not just with our ears, but hear with, with, uh, with hearts that uh, have been opened by you to receive uh, this, uh, this revelation of, of your wisdom. And then transform us. Change us to be more like you. We ask this in your name. Amen. So Proverbs is, is about how we, um, how we flourish as humans in a world created by God. How do we flourish in this world? Proverbs uh, is, uh, is, is, is meant to help us to do that. This, um, uh, this living in this world, this universe designed by God as creatures created by him. And so the book presents two ways of life, the way of wisdom and the way of folly. Right? And I don't mean to kind of divide you guys that way. I could say the way of wisdom, the way of folly. <laughs> so the way of wisdom is built on the belief that God created the world and therefore we live best when we live under his loving rule. Right? We live best when we live under his loving rule. And the way of folly is based on the belief that I am my own master. I am the ruler of my life. And therefore, I live best when I, de- when I determine the scope and meaning of my life. And in today's society, that often shows up as a radical individualism. It's been described like this. In our American culture, in our Canadian culture, which often seeps into our church culture, we see a focus on individualism, on climbing the ladder of success at all costs, at placing high value on high returns, on outward expressions of attainment, and our own personal health, wealth, and happiness. And as a result, we view people through this same grid and reduce them to a profit-loss chart. Right? And so we, um, 
we can say it like this, all right? And, and this is a, 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 when you put it like this, you know, all of us kind of maybe recoil a little bit, but we can say it like this. I care about you if you have use value to me. I care about you if you have use value to me. And if you don't, then you are just someone to be taken advantage of. And when we say it like that, oh, that doesn't sound very good, right? But, but it, it, it creeps into our thinking. It, it is, it is the, the mindset behind the radical individualism of our day. In this message, what I want to do is I want, to, I want God's word to challenge us about this kind of self-centered individualism. And our Bible passage is Proverbs 18, verse 22 through uh, chapter 19, verse 9. And there are two broad topics in this, in this particular section. Uh, one verse about marriage, and then a lot of verses about money. And I think there's a reason these two are presented together back to back. I think they're connected. Uh, and so as we work through the passage, I, I hope we'll see that God did not make us to be rugged individualists. Right? But, he, but he designed us to take responsibility for each other so that only together will we flourish in his world. All right, so let's talk about first marriage and uh, the creation mandate. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute, what, what that means, the creation mandate. Marriage and the creation mandate. So um, our text for this message begins with a very ringing endorsement of marriage. Uh, chapter 18, verse 22 he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. All right, so marriage is good. Marriage is God's idea, and a spouse is God's gift to us. If you desire to get married, you desire something good. If you, have, if you are married, you have found what is good. All right? um, if you are seeking a spouse, you are seeking good. No, <laughs> thank you for that endorsement, yes. Bit young, but maybe one day, right? Now let me add that the New Testament, um, from, the, from the New Testament perspective, singleness is also good and a gift from God. Singleness is also good and a gift from God. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that singleness is better in some ways than marriage. But that in no way, you know, Paul's statement there is in no way meant to diminish the inherent goodness of marriage. And, and in our day, some people have a negative view of marriage, and, and I get that, right? There, there's many, um, there are many broken marriages. We had a, we had a block party a, a few uh, weeks ago, and... Uh, and, and just interacting with some neighbors. That, that was some of the stuff that, you know, kind of came across with this negative view of marriage. And I get that. There's a lot of broken marriages with strife and with heartache. And, and so we need this reminder that, that a wife and a husband is a blessing from God. Marriage is not just a human institution. It is not just a social contract. It is God's good design. But why is it God's good design? What is good about marriage? Go back to Genesis chapter 2 in your mind, or if you want to open the scriptures to there. But Genesis chapter 2 tells us about the first marriage between Adam and Eve. And in that account, God says of Adam, right, it is not good for the man to be alone. Why is marriage good? It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So notice the connection with Proverbs, right? It, it is not good for the man to be alone. He who finds a wife finds good. Marriage is good because otherwise... Man, we could say woman, would be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. 
Now, it's important that we understand what this means, right? Because, uh, and we talked about this when we looked at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4, because uh, we often have this idea of a loan that, that maybe isn't quite what um, Genesis means. Right? So Christopher Ashe has, has really kind of developed this idea, and, and let me just share some of his comments on this. He says, it's very common to take a loan to mean lonely. To mean lonely. And so, ah, we say, he writes, ah, we say, poor Adam was lonely. There he was in the garden, surrounded by animals. But a pet dog, a cat, an ox, a parakeet, or goldfish, they don't meet his relational needs. God will give him a wife so that he will not be lonely anymore. That's how we understand this. In other words, the common way we understand marriage is that it primarily addresses our need to be loved. And unless we are married, we will be lonely. And the context of Genesis 2, Ash argues, is that it points us in a different direction. This is what he says. Verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2 does not come out of the blue but is part of, a part of a drama, a story that begins in verse 4. And right at the very start of this second telling of the creation account, there is a problem. There's no man to work the ground. There's no man to farm the land. And so naturally, God makes a man to do just that, to care for his world, uh, Genesis 2, verse 7. And so he puts man in the garden, and he gives him his orders, which are to work the garden and keep or guard it. And this is what Adam is made to do, to, 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 to care for the world that God has created. And in this context, God takes a good look at the garden, and at little Adam standing, bemused in the middle of it, and in effect, and in effect says, I can see that it is not good for him to be given this job to do on his own. It is not good, not because he's lonely, but quite simply because the job is too big for him to do on his own. And this is why he is given a helper, which simply means one who works alongside so that both together can do the task. I don't want you to take from that. Please don't take from that. That marriage is just utilitarian so that we can complete a task. Please. Okay, that's not what I mean. Right? Marriage is wondrously relational. It is deeply emotional. The Son of Psalms is in the Bible. So I don't, want to take, I don't want you to take from that that, that that marriage is just merely this, you know, let's get a task done. And yet at the very core of what makes marriage good are a husband and a wife together fulfilling the creation mandate, together fulfilling why God made us, why God created us to care for his work. And that is not just to tend a garden, but to be wise rulers and stewards of God's world. That's the creation mandate. We were made to steward, to rule the world. And we were not made to do that on our own. Now, if we stop there, then we might think Solomon is merely concerned about our marital status. But I don't think he was. I don't think he was. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and uh, we're going to look at this next section and what it has to say about money. And then we will come back to this one verse and what it says about marriage. All right, so let's now talk about money in an unjust world, in an unjust world society. I want you to do a quick scan of uh, Proverbs 18 verse 23 through chapter 19 verse 9. 
And you'll see some repeated themes. Right, so just do a quick scan through this. And notice what gets repeated. The poor are mentioned several times. Verse 23, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, chapter 19, verse 4, chapter 19, verse 7. Right, so the poor are mentioned a number of times. Friends are also mentioned four times in these verses. Proverbs 18, verse 24. Proverbs 19, verse 4. Proverbs 19, verse 6. And verse 7. And then notice Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will not go free. And that is repeated almost verbatim in verse Nine, a false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will, will perish. So here's what I think um, is going on here. How, here's how I think these verses are held together. Solomon's concern is with justice. He's concerned about justice. Um, he's especially concerned about how systems of power are used to abuse those um, who are needy, and to take advantage of them, especially for one's own gain. And so God made this world so that we might flourish in it, but God's design is terribly marred by injustice. Here's this world God made where we're all meant to flourish. But sin comes in, and as a result, injustice. And instead of everybody flourishing, we have some who flourish and some who don't. And we have, um, we have those who do taking advantage of those who don't for their own gain. And furthermore, Solomon especially highlights that it is the poor who are those who are often disadvantaged. And while the rich seem to have many friends, who support and help them to get their way, the poor have few to stand with them. So let me just kind of develop this. Let's just kind of work through the passage and see how this, how this um, plays out. First, we begin with, notice the plight of the poor. Notice the plight of the poor. Verse 23. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. This plea is a cry for help in a time of need. It's the, it's the outpouring, almost the panic desperation of someone in trouble. Who of us has, has never been in a difficult situation, right? Who of us has, has never needed help? Perhaps, only, perhaps it's only those of us who are too proud to ask for help. who have never sensed our need that, that we, we are desperately in, in trouble at, at points in our lives. And in that time of trouble, this individual here, the, the, the poor person here, cries for, for mercy. The context suggests that this poor person is in, a, is in a dispute with a more powerful person, perhaps in a judicial or commercial setting. But instead of mercy, he or she is met with a harsh, strong, unyielding response. And we see that in society, right? Too often, the, the cries of the poor and, and other vulnerable people are brushed aside. Indeed, they're, they're taken advantage of and, and discriminated against. But it doesn't have to be that way. Right? And so, verse 24 says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. In this passage, friends refer to fair-weather friends. Right? So in this passage from 1823 to 19 verse 9, keep in mind that friends refer to fair-weather friends. They are superficial friends. They don't stick with you. And it's unfortunate that our translation of, of the verse repeats the word friend in the second half of this, uh, in the second line, 
uh, although it tries to distinguish this by saying, but there is a friend, to say, uh, yeah, yeah, but there's someone else, there's someone different who sticks closer than a brother. Uh, if, if, if I could um, translate this line a, a little bit more woodenly, it would go something like this. But there is one who loves, who sticks closer than a brother. There's one who loves. One who has, uh, one who has unreliable friends, superficial, fair weather friends will soon come to ruin. But there is one who loves, who sticks closer than a brother. Love is the crazy glue of true friendship. And it's great when there is someone in our life who we can count on. The true friend supports us in times of crisis. Even when everyone else abandons us, the true friend sticks with us. The friendship between David and Jonathan had this kind of stickiness. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the friend in our lives, who, who, um, who loves us and, and never forsakes us. He, he, he's the ultimate in terms of sticking with us. But the point of the verse is to say, you and I need to be this kind of person who sticks, who loves and who sticks closer than a brother. And especially... We need to love the poor in this way. Especially we need to love the poor in this way. And those who are otherwise disadvantaged and vulnerable. Don't side with the rich person who, who um, surrounds himself with many friends that support him in his harshness. Don't be attracted to that kind of a person and his money. The friendships that he has, they are superficial. They won't be there when trouble comes. When the rich person's wealth or his power or his popularity or his influence, when they are shattered and his world is broken in pieces, they won't be there. So don't collude with the, with, with the powerful and the rich against the poor. But be that friend. Be that one who loves, who sticks closer than a brother to help those who are in need. The passage goes on to show the scheming of the rich. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1, sets a choice before us. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are, are perverse. Money has, has many benefits. Money has many benefits. But money also has a way of distorting our value system. It has this way of distorting our value system. It can become so important to us that we compromise what God wants of us. And here we have two people. So on one hand, there's a poor person whose life is blameless. It means that um, they seek to live in a way that is consistent with faith in Christ. They, lived a way, they seek to live in a way um, that, is, um, that, that, that comes fully from the heart, out of the completeness of a heart that is devoted to Christ. This is the person who is blameless. We might call it spiritual integrity. They are fully committed to the Lord. On the flip side, there is, a, there is a fool who twists God's truth for his own gain, right? Whose lips are perverse, who twists God's truth uh, for his own gain. And we should probably identify him with the rich person in verse 23 who answers harshly. His words are twisted to defraud his neighbor. And so two people, a poor blameless person and a rich, foolish person. Who would you rather be? Who would you rather be? 
in God's value system, spiritual integrity is more important than material wealth. Spiritual integrity, more important than spiritual wealth, uh, sorry, more important than material wealth every day. Uh, now, of course, you can be poor and a fool. You can be rich and blameless. Right? Um, and I know you would say, hey, if I had a choice, I want to be rich and blameless. But, but those aren't the choices here. We need to take seriously the temptations surrounding wealth. And we pay too high a price when we pursue financial gain at the expense of spiritual integrity. We pay too high a price. The love of money, desire for wealth, will lead us astray. It will lead us astray. Proverbs 19 verse 2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? The knowledge and wisdom of God, that's real wealth. But when our appetites are disconnected from that, when, it's, when they're disconnected from God's wisdom, that's not good. Why? Because it perpetuates the brokenness of the world. It keeps that going. And then that greed leads to sinful actions. Scholars point out that the, that expression, hasty feet, in Proverbs, it always refers to someone who acts quickly without concern for the consequences, especially in order to make money. So hasty feet in Proverbs always is a person who, who I don't care about the consequences. I'm, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do and especially in order to make money. And so greedy desires run towards unjust schemes to enrich oneself at the expense of others. And you know this, God hates our unjust schemes. God hates our unjust schemes. Verse 2 calls it missing the way which is another way of saying it's sin. And then verse 3 expands on this and reveals the pride or the arrogance behind our, our greed and injustice. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. What this means is that the fool's ways will be overturned. His foolish scheming will be exposed. It, it will be judged. And we'll come back to that in, in a moment. But, but, in, but, but here's this person who's, 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 um, who's folly, brings about ruin. Um, he sees the, 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 you know, how everything's overturned. What he was aiming for, it, it just, it's all broken. And, 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 and yet, instead of, you know, acknowledging his sinfulness... The fool blames God for, uh, for the undoing of his schemes. He rages against the Lord. And this is what pride looks like, right? This is what pride looks like. There's this sense of entitlement that rages even against God when we don't get what we want. And shake our fists. This is the scheming of the rich against the disadvantaged. Finally, in this passage, um, as it develops, we see that the plight of the poor and the scheming of the, of the rich results in the perversion of justice. So earlier we said this, this, poor, friend, this poor person needs a friend who will stick closer than a brother to them. But unfortunately... That's not the case in, in most instances. 
Verse 4, wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. All right, keep in mind, friends in this passage, superficial friends, um, fair weather friends. Uh, we say money can't buy happiness, money can't buy friends, money can't buy love, but you can attract a lot of people if you have money. Right, you're going to attract a lot of hangers on if you have wealth. People will gravitate towards you, right? Um, conversely, when you don't have friends, those same kind of fair-weather friends will abandon you when the demands become too great. And that's the reality, right? Not all friendships pass the loyalty test. Not all friendships pass that test. And in this particular co context, we're, we're, we're to think of a conflict, a dispute between a poor person and a rich person, and what comes to mind is the, the poor person's um, so-called friend abandons him because he or she doesn't want to antagonize the rich person. It's too much trouble. One result of this perverting effect of money is that those with power and influence can buy the support of many while even the lone friend of the poor will be swayed to desert them. And verse 5 speaks to this perversion of justice primarily in the context of a, of a courtroom where people are willing to perjure themselves to win a case, right? So you have a person with power and with wealth buying a false testimony or buying uh, a person uh, to, to abandon, testifying on behalf of the needy and disadvantaged. And so they think that by lying to, per to perpetuate injustice, they will profit from someone else's suffering. And God comes along in this verse and says, he will expose and he will, he will judge such lies. A false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will not go free. This is God's judgment. Now, now, the reality is that perjury is not always detected in a human court, right? Perjury is not always detected in a human court. That's why there is injustice sometimes in, in, uh, in power systems. Peter Le uh, Lightheart says this, and I think this is a, a good reminder for us. He says, Yes, perjury is not always detected in a, in a human court. But there is a court overshadowing the courts of this world. And in this higher court, the perjurer will not escape. And then he goes on and he applies this reality beyond the courtroom to all of our relationships. And he says, we live before the face of God. We live before the face of God, the judge of all the earth. All our words will be brought into scrutiny. All our lies are a kind of false witness in the courtroom of the world. And liars will not go unpunished. God will judge. That. And yet, even though God will judge our lives, the fool in his greed and in his pride still defies the Lord. Why would he do that? And, and we come back to the, to the distorting effect of money. Proverbs 19, verses 6 and 7. Many curry favor with a ruler. Everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. 
The poor are shunned by all their relatives. How much more do their friends avoid them? Though the poor pursue them with pleading, they are nowhere to be found. And so we, we see this currying of favor with a ruler. That's how the world often works. Money equals influence. You have money, you have power. You have power, you have influence. And in the ancient world, a person would curry favor with a ruler or a judge by bringing a gift. Before making his plea, before he comes to the ruler and says, would you do this for me? He brings a gift. And normally, giving gifts is a good thing. Right? We, someone gives you a gift, you like it. It's good to give gifts. But when, when those gifts are essentially a bribe, it's evil. And, you know, perhaps we should connect this back with Proverbs 18, verse 23, where the, the poor have nothing to give when they come to make their plea. He pleads for mercy, but he has nothing to bring to curry the favor of the ruler. In fact, verse 7 says, they have nobody who will help them before the ruler. The poor are shunned by all their relatives. Um, even their family wants nothing to do with them. And, and, and in this context where we're talking about injustice, the point is that those with wealth can easily target those without using their influence to gain an advantage. This is the perverting, distorting effect of money. Andrew Crouch writes something that is, to me, just, just incredibly profound. He says, first of all, money has contributed genuinely to human flourishing. Right? Money has many benefits. It is, it is contributed genuinely to, to human flourishing. But, he goes on to say, money has not helped us to be persons. That to me is profound. Money has not helped us to be persons. What he means is this. It operates in a, in a sphere where heart, soul, mind, and strength complexes, us, designed for love, are simply not relevant. It is designed for a world where we do not need love or even relationship to get what we want. Isn't that true? The more time we spend in the world that money makes, the more we become conformed to its image. The distorting effect of money. Not saying it's evil, right? It's just saying we got to understand. We got to understand its effect on us. that it distorts if we love it. And so we want to counteract that. How do we do that? We need wisdom. Verse 8. The one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. Let me translate um, a few words in this verse a little bit more differently um, because I think there's some important truths to see here from the original Hebrew, right? So let me translate the, the verse like this. The one who gets a heart loves life. The one who gets a heart loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will find good. One who cherishes understanding will find good. Uh, perhaps I should add, the one who gets a new heart loves life. 
Because the heart we're born with, the heart we're born with loves money, it, it, it seeks self-gain, it, it takes advantage of others. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Sin has corrupted us, which is why injustice exists in the world. But through the gospel, through faith in Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for us, through, through, through Jesus, God restores us to himself with a new heart that desires wisdom. He gives that to us. And if we really want to love life, right? Love life, you've heard people say. If you really want to love life, if you want to have a true biblical self-love, that you, that you truly love yourself, if you want to really love life, then you need to get a heart. I need to get a heart. A God-shaped, spirit-enlivened, God, Christ-glorifying heart. That is life. That is love. Loving yourself as you really ought to. And if we have this new heart, we will cherish understanding. And through it, we will find what is good. Does that sound familiar at all? Find what is good. It connects us, I, I think it connects us back to chapter 18 of verse 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good. And I want to suggest that the, the, the connection there is deliberate between that one verse about marriage and this extended section about money and justice. What is that connection? Well, you can struggle with it. Let me give you two ideas, all right? One possibility is that the section on justice informs us about the kind of a wife that a man should seek or the kind of husband a, a woman should seek. If God's design for marriage is for a husband and wife to be wise rulers and stewards together of God's world, then seek a spouse who will work alongside of you to do what is right and just and fair. That's what you're looking for. Seek a wife, seek a husband who will... Who will Walk with you in doing what is right and just and fair. So that's one possibility in terms of why these two, two, there's this connection between them. Another way to look at the connection between marriage and justice is to see the passage flowing the other way. Right? Instead of justice showing us the kind of marriage that we should seek, the biblical design of marriage shows us Justice is fundamentally about obedience to the creation mandate. That justice is primarily about seeking the flourishing of human lives in God's world under his rule. We want to rule the world by ourselves and for ourselves, but that's how injustice flourishes. So in this unjust world, money makes it seem like we can rule our lives without ever bothering with love, without ever bothering with relationships. Money makes us impersonal. I don't need anybody if I've got money. Even our friendships are superficial where people are merely a means to advance our goals to get more and more. But when we go back to the beginning, we see, no, that's not how we were made to care for the world. 
We can't be wise stewards of God's world on our own, for ourselves. If we're going to see justice advance and people truly flourish, we need to value true community. We need to love like Christ loves us. We need to stick closer than a brother. Especially in building relationships with those who are downtrodden and hurting in society. And, and personally, I think this latter emphasis is where Solomon is going uh, in this particular passage because, uh, because verse 9, he, you know, he follows this up with verse 9, which basically repeats verse 5. You know, Solomon. Did you forget that just a few verses earlier you had said, said you know, these exact same words? No, I think he deliberately does this here to reinforce, to stress God's condemnation of injustice in this world. And so, so he says again, with just one small change, a false witness will not go unpunished. Whoever pours out lies will perish. Uh, the, the liar who is not free will perish. God will judge. He is passionate for justice. We may not see justice in our lifetime, but we live before the face of God, the judge of all the earth, and he will make right that which is wrong. He will bring justice. God didn't make us to be rugged individualists. And I'll be the first to, to stand up and say and confess to you, I struggle with that. But God didn't make us to be rugged individualists. He designed marriage so that a husband and wife together will be good stewards of his creation. And likewise, we are rulers and stewards of the world, not on our own, but by loving those in community with us so that together we advance justice in the world. And then we come to the New Testament and we see something brand new, incredible. And I think, it, it, and I, you know, I'm still developing this thought, but it, but, but it's, it seems to me one of the reasons why there's, there's there's almost a slightly different view of marriage in the New Testament and and singleness in the New Testament versus versus what it says in the Old Testament. But there's this new thing called the church. This new community of the redeemed, where in this community. There is, Acts 4, verse 34, verse 34, no needy person among them. And so we meet, may we as a church, by God's grace, love one another in word and deed the people that God brings into our lives, that may we love one another, may we stick closer than a brother and sister uh, in, in people's times of need, and especially build this kind of community that God talks about with those who have been neglected and marginalized in our world, in our society. God calls us to be that new community of the redeemed. Let's pray together. Father, um, this world is, is so broken. And we live in this world and sometimes we're the ones who 
we're the ones who've contributed to that brokenness. Sometimes that brokenness comes upon us, crashes upon us. So many times we don't know what to do, how to respond. Teach us first and foremost to fall on our knees and plead with you. To come to the one who will never respond to us with harshness. Teach us to plead with you. Then open our eyes to those around us. to go, as we said earlier, in, in your love. Help us to be the community of, of your people who love one another, who seek the, the good of each other. To be the people you called us to be. We confess that we, we do this We don't do this well. We need so much of your working, of your grace, of your spirit in us that we might truly be a a people of justice, of seeking the, the, the flourishing of one another especially to be mindful, to, to see, to, to build relationships with those who are needy and hurting. I thank you so much for this church. I thank you so much for, for your spirit that works in us, continues to transform us and change us. As we come to your word and we see Jesus in it, Lord, make us to be like Jesus. Make us to be like him. Help us to love, to stick closer than a brother and sister, even to one another. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.